Let's talk about uh, the motion of a turbine through an, a, a magnetic field. So here we have a north pole and a south pole, and here are magnetic lines of field going in between. And then we have this rectangular shaped conductor, and the conductor is going to rotate, so it's cutting uh, through the uh, uh, magnetic lines of flux. And of course, as it does that, it generates uh, an electrical uh, current. But let's think of this perhaps not just a uh, rectangular uh, conductor, but say we had just a straight rod conductor, and we had it say like this, and then we're going to move it through the magnetic field like this in this circular motion. So we can imagine it being something like this, where there are magnetic lines of flux going from top to bottom all across here. And we have, again, just a single rod conductor like this, and it's going to cut through those magnetic lines of flux in that circular motion. Now, when the rod first begins its circular journey, right here at this point, it's the direction of its velocity is pointing directly upward. So right here then, the direction of its motion is parallel to the magnetic field. So right here, when it first starts moving, it's going straight up. It's not cutting across any magnetic lines of flux. It's just simply is moving parallel to them. Then when it gets around to here, well, up here at this part of the circle, now it's cutting across these magnetic lines of flux at a right angle. And when it's at this position, that's when it cuts across the magnetic lines of flux most rapidly. And we can try to visualize that in a different way, perhaps. Suppose that this is a street, and there are lines pinned in the street, and we have four people. One is walking parallel to the street, so of course he's not going to cut across any of these lines. And then another one proceeds to go across the street at a 60 degree angle. Then another, yet another walker goes across here at a 30 degree angle. This one cuts across at a 60 degree angle. And the fourth pedestrian goes directly across at a 90 degree angle. And assume they're all walking at the uh, same speed. Clearly, this one has the least distance to travel. So this one is going to get to the other side of the street quicker. Or, to put it another way, this one is going to cut across these lines at a faster rate than these other two. And that's what's happening here, is that initially, as we have a vertical rod like this, moving around the circle, cutting across the magnetic lines of flux, first it's going completely parallel to them. And then as it progresses through the circle, here its motion is straight upward, so it's parallel to the magnetic lines of flux. Then as it progresses through along the circle, it cuts through the magnetic lines of flux at a sharper and sharper angle. Now, to find the top is cutting across them at a 90 degree angle. And just as we saw with this other diagram, that is when then you traverse these lines of flux most quickly. So what that means is that that is where you're going to generate the maximum amount of current or the maximum amount of voltage. Because we know that it is how fast a conductor cuts through magnetic lines of flux that determines the magnitude. And that's what we have demonstrated over here. 
This point right here corresponds to here, so that there's an upward motion. You're going parallel to the lines of flux. There is no magnetic, there is no, say, uh, e, no voltage induced. This can be time. Now, when you're at the 90 degrees, that's when you have the maximum voltage induced. Then you go around back to here. Now here you were cutting through the magnetic lines of field at 90 degrees, but now you're going to be doing it at a smaller and smaller angle to finally here you're going parallel, or actually counter-parallel, to, to the magnetic lines of flux, so the voltage falls off to zero. Now when we're down here, now the angle is getting steeper and steeper, till once again it cuts through to 90 degree angle, so we're going to have increased voltage, but now we're going, th we're cutting through the lines of flux in a direction opposite to when the, the rod or the conductor is moving along this part of the circle. Here it's moving upward, here it's moving downward. So the maximum voltage that gets induced has an opposite polarity. We know that if we have again magnetic lines of flux and we move a conductor through these in one direction that of course will give us a voltage and if we do it in the opposite direction that gives us a voltage in the opposite direction or the opposite magnitude and that's what's happening right here so we see that what comes out of this We have the conductor moving around this circle in a circular motion, cutting across the magnetic lines of flux. What that generates then is a sine wave of induced voltage in that conductor. And again, um, the motion of the conductor around the circle, that can be represented like this then. here, 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 and here, where of course this corresponds to this position, this corresponds to this point on the graph, this corresponds to this point on the graph, and this corresponds to this point on the graph. So again, we have a phasor type situation that we can use to analyze the motion of our uh, conductor as it, mo as it moves through the magnetic lines of flux that generates this um, sine wave of induced voltage in the conductor as it moves uh, through the magnetic field. Now, so again, we just want to um, uh, put this out as another simple example of how phasers can be used to represent physical systems. Uh, in the last video we had a mechanical representation. Here we have more of a uh, um, uh, electrical uh, representation for a, for a phasor problem. Now, that means that we can think of this, that our vector here has, we can describe it in two ways. And let's just look at a simple xy plane. We can make it a little bit neater. Say X and Y. And here's a vector, V. Well, we can describe this vector, of course, in terms of its X components. And its y components, we can say that vector v equals the square root of v x squared plus v y squared. It's x components and it's y components. We certainly know how to do that. Another way that we can represent this vector, just looking at it now in a, a two-dimensional vector, is using polar coordinates.
where here we have a vector of a certain magnitude. We'll just call it R. And it makes a certain angle theta with the x-axis. So here then we can describe the vector by its magnitude, how long it is, and the angle that it makes with the x-axis. Or we could have a different vector, call this R1. We could have another one like this that has magnitude R2 and that makes an angle of theta 2 with the x-axis. So again, this vector is described by its magnitude and the angle that it makes with the x-axis. So here then are two different ways, two very simple ways of describing a vector in a two-dimensional plane, the xy plane, either by explicitly its x components and its y components, or by the magnitude of the vector and the angle that that vector makes with the x-axis. Um, and this is, of course, is polar representation, where here we just have our um, uh, rectangular Cartesian uh, representation. Both of them have their advantages, as we will see in the next video. And our phasers, our phasor vector can be, then, it can have this component, a horizontal, and a vertical component. So it can be described with our rectangular coordinate system, or it can also be described with the polar coordinate system. Um, both systems are used. Now, and of course we can convert back and forth from one to another. We know this is Vy. This of course is Vx. And this angle right here, well the tangent of that angle is Vy divided by Vx. Or we'd say that theta equals the inverse tangent of Vy divided by Vx. So here the angle theta that we're going to use in our polar representation can certainly be determined from the rectangular coordinate system that we're using here. And the magnitude of vector R2 and the magnitude of vector R1, well, we could just say its magnitude would be its Vx and its Vy components added up, squared, added up, and taken the square root of. So it certainly is possible to convert back and forth from our rectangular coordinate system to our polar coordinate system. And what we'll do in the uh, next video is we'll have several worked examples uh, where we go back and forth between rectangular coordinates and polar coordinates because sometimes determining what the angle theta is um, for our polar coordinate system, for going back and forth like this, it can be sometimes a little bit ambiguous, or not ambiguous, but we have to think about what we're doing. And we'll have several examples. Um, we will work through that. And again, we do that because using rectangular coordinates and using polar coordinates, those are our tools when we're going to be solving problems using um, uh, phasor analysis techniques. So in the next videos, what we'll do is we'll work several examples here then. And then once we do that, we can talk about more about impedance and reactants and alternating uh, uh, circuits. So that's what we're doing in the uh, upcoming videos. I think this is video number 69. 
in our electrical circuit analysis. Anyway, the playlist for all the videos is at the website digital-university.org.